the network. Oh, what's up, everybody? Once again, it's Brand Man Sean, and we have a very special series for you guys today. We're kicking off something, and this is episode number one. I know a lot of you have probably followed the Music News That Matters newsletter, where we cover what the news is and why it matters, right? We cover some very important topics that have happened every single month, and we drop that newsletter on the first of every month. Well, we've decided to now do a podcast in addition. We're on the first of every month. We're going to be dropping a Music News That Matters podcast where we expound on it even deeper for you guys to really get an idea of why these things are so relevant. And of course, we'll cover some topics that aren't on the newsletter and vice versa. So first and foremost, I want to introduce you to the person who even brought me this idea in the first place, content director at brandmannetwork.com and so so many other things, right? I'll let him describe himself to you, you and give him a little bit of background before we get into this first episode. But Joshua, Joshua Coase, introduce yourself to everybody. Glad to be doing this with you, buddy. Me too. Yeah, good to be here. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Josh. Um, I've been working in the music industry for the past couple of years. Started out in music journalism, worked for various publications, including Majestic Casual. I was one of the founding editors of their editorial website called Majestic Journal. And then I sort of moved into more marketing and artist work. I've managed a couple of artists and producers. And I currently work in Music PR, one of the UK's leading music business consultancies, where we work with a range of clients in the, in the trade market, more so than the consumer ones. But my main background now is obviously Music PR and working at the Brandman Network as well. Oh, dope, man. So, I mean, let's go ahead and get into it soon because our goal for this podcast is very simple, right? Like what the music is and why it matters. But I think think a better way to say it is we want to make it as digestible as possible, right? For especially the indie artist, right? Because things are so, so many things are happening. So many new opportunities are happening. But of course, it's hard to keep up with things. So we want to help people keep up with things by first, giving you the most important things that have happened that month, you know, that four or five versus this whole list where it's just, it's deep, it's it's dense. And then also, Mm -hmm. of course, explain based on some of the things that you might not know. So um, let's get started with an interesting topic. Uh, Well, as a matter of fact, tell us an overview of the topics that we'll talk about today, but then let's go ahead and get it to number one. So we're going to cover some, some legal music law. We're going to cover Spotify, YouTube, Facebook, lots of things going on on all their fronts. I'm also going to get into a bit of TikTok as well as some marketing trends for 2020 to look forward to as well. Cool. So number one, let's go ahead and do that one. Because yeah, we're, starting, we're, going, we're going in hard. It's very complicated. So this is the CASE Act, which means the Copyright Alternative in Small Claims Enforcement Act. So it sound, again, it sounds really heavy right off the bat. But essentially, if this, if this law passes, it's going to make it a lot more affordable for artists, producers and songwriters to claim for copyright infringement without going through the, the federal court for the legal process. So the, it's got one more vote to go. It's got to go to the Senate. But it did pass the vote in the US House of Representatives by 410 votes to six last week. So it looks set that it's going to be passed. And what it means is that you don't have to pay, and you don't have to have an attorney. You haven't got to go to court yourself either. Now, you if, if you go to if you have to fly, if you have to file a copyright infringement, you can earn up to thirty thousand dollars in damages, and it doesn't seem like a lot on the face of it. But when you compare that currently, it would cost you more than two hundred thousand dollars in legal fees, and the fact that you could only really earn seven hundred fifty dollars to one hundred fifty thousand if you did win the case. $30,000 with a maximum of $5,000 in legal fees doesn't seem so bad. Yeah, exactly. Right? It's, it's, it's interesting because, of course, like you said, you have this idea of, yo, well, we can't get this huge number that we possibly could have gotten before. But when you just think of a quality versus quantity perspective mm-hmm. of that, it just makes it so much easier to do more of it. And, and face that issue where now I don't have to worry about the complications of a lawyer or just even understanding that process, which a lot of artists don't even necessarily know how to know how to deal with. And of course, those lawyers take those fees. So exactly. if you make one hundred fifty thousand, once you get, you know, factor in that lawyer fee, that's 
that's going to be a, a far smaller number. And a plus, a lot of people aren't getting a, a 150000 A lot of people are getting less. So then again, you still have to pay your lawyer. So just to be able to go in without a lawyer, of course, you have to be registered. So that, that just makes the process so much easier anyway. I think that's a part of it. It's like, okay, if it's straightforward, why do we need this extra layer or middleman in the process? I'm thinking that's mm. some of how they're looking at it. Um, but then... Right. Since we don't have that and we go ahead and finish the bill up, I'm interested to see why they decided you could only do it in small claims. That's the interesting part to me, though. Like, why are they limiting it to up to 30,000 when, OK, I don't need a lawyer anymore, you're saying, but the damages are still equivalent. Nothing has changed there. I'm, I'm confused about that part. Personally, I have to dig in deeper. So they have claims that the idea behind it is that it will deter copyright trolls and anyone trying to you know, take advantage of the system. Oh, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But yeah, on the flip that. side, I'm kind of thinking because the barrier to entry is now so low, won't that encourage them? Because obviously it's not going to cost them anywhere near as much. It's not going to cost them much to do it. Right, right. I forgot. You know what? I forgot. We yeah. even talked about that the first time this came up. Yeah, that that trolling issue, I agree. When the barrier is that that you know low, they, people have time. I mean, the, the quantity thing doesn't have that big of an um, impact on someone who has the time to be a troll in the first place. So it's, it sucks that the actual artist or a real person will have to suffer just because they have to create some kind of systems insurance for a troll. Mm. But I think it's going to be interesting to see if this actually passes, and I think it will. But I think it will, yeah. After it passes, I want to see people actually use it. And those yeah. are the, the more interesting stories for us to cover, for sure. So the idea is that it will get, the cases will get heard by three judges in the copyright claims department, and they will they won't do every case. They will review the cases beforehand. They're not going so they they do sense it's some copyright trolling. They won't actually hear the case. So there is going to be some sort of like order to it, and also the fact that it's important to mention that you don't have to register with copyright to own a copyright for your song, but if you do want to claim, you do need to register which will cost you between $35 and $55. But if you do it, if you wait till after you've already had the infringement, it's going to cost you like $800 plus. So I really encourage you, if you think that it's going to, if someone's going to infringe your work and you think that it's going to be a possibility, I would register way beforehand. Because mm-hmm. if not, you're going to get yourself into, a, you know, a lot deeper water with it. And Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, that's probably the key takeaway at the moment since we haven't got a chance to watch any other cases in real time. Mm-hmm. Just go ahead and get your copyrights. Go ahead and do that ASAP because it is easy, man. Like the I, the fact that you don't even have to show up in court. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's crazy. All right, that that that's crazy. I, I gotta do some more research. We should cover this again on a future episode. But when it comes to like why this and who are the main characters in getting this passed and push and buying for this, because I'm trying to figure out the incentive. Right. Government doesn't just do anything without some incentive or somebody pushing from somewhere. But that's it's it's too helpful for artists on a service level. <laughs> that, that's, well, it's, yes, it's generally just for creators in general. And I think a lot of the campaigns have, have come from a creative background and they know that most creators can't, you know, they can't fight for their for their work. They can't represent themselves. They just it's just like it's just too high entry level. They can't afford the legal fees. Like so they're essentially yeah. saying that. You you know oh your copyright got infringed that sucks but you can't do anything about it and that's sort of been the way it has been because the internet has created all these problems and yeah and it makes more sense I think the biggest thing right is it just makes more sense for the new industry of such a high content model um industry mm. right and not just music just anything like you said creatives like it's just so much content so making it easier to actually go through right but also limiting the uh the amount that's taken i think both of those also go to that structure as well where it's not as long and drawn out so we can get out the way but we're get they're probably getting more and more of these i don't know how many right but they're probably getting so many of them that the resources of court aren't even there and i don't think people realize not just when it comes to content um for artists but i mean just regular legal issues like criminal activity and things like that there's courts that have issues 
in terms of having the resources to convict yeah. as much as they want to and, and things of that nature. So some of this might be helping with that side of the process as well. And just think of all the claims they're going to get if this case passes early. You've got like, photographers, they're constantly getting their work you know, used online without their permission and it's just going to yeah. be a... It's going to be a lot. That's why I think they put the caps in place. So the caps are fifteen thousand dollars per case, but you can up to thirty thousand dollars if you want to do two different ones in the same case. And then it's five thousand dollars max in legal fees. So, <laughs> yeah, that's that's all. This is very, very much. Uh, how can we handle quantity model? That's so in, that when that add two, right? If you want to throw two in, you're getting the two for one model. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> for but no fees. more. For, no more. <laughs> yeah, that's dope. Um, I think those are my, my my entry level thoughts on on that one. What's what's the next topic, man? I'm, let's get into the other thing. Yeah, so just to round that one off, there is no date set yet for the vote in the Senate as of recording today on the 1st of November. Yeah, there's no, but I imagine it'll be quite soon. No, definitely before the end of the year, I'd imagine. Mm. And yeah, we'll see if it passes. I'm sure it will. So next up, we've got Triller, uh, which is sort of like a rival to TikTok. And they're making a bit of noise in the news right now because they've just raised $28 million in their latest funding round. So I guess the question is now, like, are they going to establish themselves as a bigger player on the market? Considering that now in this new deal, in this new funding round, all the major labels now own a stake. And, you know, that's not the case for TikTok. And I'm thinking they're going to prioritize the content and music licensing for Triller because they've got, you know, invest, they've got invested interest into it. Mm. Yeah. My thing is, there's probably, all right, for the labels to all get embedded with each other in one form or fashion, one, they have to believe in, there has to be threat, Right. Yeah, they're not gonna just do it for fun. So they really have to believe in this platform, the value that they want to get revenue from it. But two, the threat not only is these types of uh, apps as well, but even bigger TikTok. I, I really think these labels look at TikTok as a threat, especially with TikTok throwing um starting this streaming service. Obviously, it's not available to all, but TikTok. I forgot the name of the streaming service. We'll, we'll, we'll get into that. Yeah. Okay. We'll get cool. into that a bit. Yeah. Yeah. So like doing something like that. I believe TikTok is actually one of the bigger players that has one of the best opportunities to really speed up that process of, of, of hurting labels, right? Taking the power away from mm -hmm. labels. And why I say that is because one of the greatest assets that labels have that's keeping them in the game, is essentially the intellectual property of the artist masters and like past deals that, that legacy right that they have so when you want to use them on different platforms that the people now have to talk to them right whereas like yeah. the app has nothing to do with them but kids and behavior naturally starts to bring that type of music on there and labels are like hey you can't just use our stuff without our permission that's one of the biggest things that have kept labels in power outside of just the brand and the whole system um that's already been in place they have kept artists continuing to go there but as the industry starts to evolve and more artists start going indie right naturally the labels have to say what assets are starting to come in like we don't we're not renewing and mm -hmm. adding assets that are going to last another year because even though these songs are there are a lot of songs that are you know classics and things can be remixed forever there still has to be some sense of a bell curve of course the long tail comes in so they're making a lot of money in general from just even songs that aren't making a lot when you add up the fact that i have a lot of songs and a lot of songs making a little equals a lot but each of these hits, right? Of course, it makes a lot of money. And then, yeah. you know, eventually you want to get another hit, right? So that's kind of their model. When you think of something like artists not signing the labels as much, and then look at somebody like TikTok who saying, we have the power to blow up artists, really. They have that built into their platform and then getting into other facets of the music industry. Because that, they, they don't play, man. Um, uh, Tencent. And what well, Tencent or Byte Dance? I always Byte Dance them. owns TikTok. Byte, yeah, yeah. Byte Byte Dance. They are swallowing up a lot of different aspects of the game, right? That is ultimately going to give them an infrastructure where if they wanted to stay in house in some way, like they'll they'll have a lot of power that labels don't. They aren't able to compete with because the behavior is already on people's platform 
on the front end. So I think that's really interesting in terms of just the threat. And it shows, it really shows the hand to me of what labels understand, right? They, they understand that they have to get into where this attention is, but that's not the game they play. So of course they have to invest to get into it. So yeah, man, I, so you've I'm, got I'm interested. The, the labels are obviously investing in Triller. You've got Google have acquired Firework and they're trying to do their own version of TikTok now with this Firework app. So there firework. are, they're obviously- Tell me about them. I don't know too much about it, but I know that um, it's, a, it's, it's a very similar sort of you know platform to Triller and TikTok and Google have acquired it trying to do their own version because I think they're recognizing the importance of you know the, the platform and it's just a jumping on the trend as it were you know what I think I've, I did hear about firework I know some well, I haven't been on it but I think I know somebody who said they were on it I think they, I think it's when cool. your artist mentioned it before yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. one of the Wasn't artists it the idea it? that it flipped around you could the, the video like rotated yeah. yeah, it was something yeah. weird like that, which I, it was hard for me to figure out why it mattered. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but yeah, but yeah I, mean, I guess firework is something we'll have to look out for. There's so many apps and different types of opportunities for people to take advantage of. It's it's a but, lot for content creators yeah. to know where they want to settle down. But Sura is making noise. You know, 28 million raised. It's got uh, 13 million monthly active users, 60 million downloads. Like it is. You know, it is a big player now. And yep. I'm just wondering, because they have, obviously TikTok's ruffled so many feathers with the, the royalty payouts, disputes with the labels, and the fact that it's banning a lot of content. I'm just wondering whether some users may navigate away. Yeah, TikTok and Triller, not TikTok, Triller and Dove Smash have focused a lot on the urban market, far more than TikTok. Um, yeah. Especially the urban market in the US. Both of them have focused very heavily on it but right now just sheer number wise and adoption rate wise it's going to be hard for them to compete whenever you have the evolution and maturation of an industry especially in tech right it it's usually only going to be like two platforms right um Mm -hmm. they last and because things are so categorized today a lot of times it ends up being one platform so an example is um, how you have something like MySpace. MySpace is big, and then you have Facebook. Facebook's even bigger, and then gets rid of MySpace, right? And yeah. then Facebook pretty much has that game on lock. Now Twitter comes with a completely different direction, right? Instagram came from a direction, different direction. Snapchat, and then like these other ones are fitting in different categories and and angles. But now we just have this one massive Facebook thing where it's like it's here or mm-hmm. but, but, and the reason that is when it comes to these apps is the network effect, because and the network effect, effect is essentially saying there's a utility to how useful this thing is. If it doesn't hit this certain threshold of people being on it, it's not even useful. Right. Because it's a social yeah. network. Right. Like if, mm-hmm. I, if only me and you are on it. It's like, okay, cool, I love Josh, but I'm, I need somebody else to be on it for me to talk to, right? right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Which is why these apps typically, like if Facebook, I don't, they weren't as strategic on it, um, but so many people followed that model because it works for a good reason. It has a lot to do why they moved, how they did, how Facebook started in Harvard. Well, that's the perfect breeding ground for virality, right? All these kids exactly. on top of each other, they know each other, and even though, it's not the whole world that's on it. It's their, it's their whole world. world. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so they feel like it's, it's omnipresent to them in that small environment. And then you roll out to another college, roll out to another college. Apps can mimic it in different, many, many uh, apps can mimic that in many different ways. But the point is that the network effect is very real where eventually it just comes to a point where, yo, look, I, I, I want to be on this other one, but I just have to be over here because everybody's over here. And so it's not as useful. Nobody's posting here because we're not going to post on a billion different apps. So when you look at this game with TikTok, Triller and Dove Smash, Smash at the, one of them for very short is not going to be here. Right. Now, yeah. You know, you add in fireworks. OK, cool. Two of them is not going to be here for sure. Probably only going to be one long game somebody might get acquired and then get integrated into an instagram or twitter or one of these bigger um networks but that's going to be really interesting to see what makes tiktok so powerful i guess is that the early adopters rule of you know generation z the young users 
So in fact, 66% of the users are under 30 on there now. And they, they found a safe space there where they could, because they thought Facebook and Instagram maybe was like a bit too old for them, but they found this safe haven on this platform. And now everyone else is slowly moving over. Yeah, because everybody's going to follow, follow them. And of course, mm-hmm. they're going to age up as well. Exactly. So, like, it, it works like that. And just the fact that they're so ahead of the game, numbers wise, right? Behavior is huge when it comes to this app. Like, every, well, not this app, just pretty much everything when it comes to adoption and people being used to it. So the fact that they have, they already have so many people used to that, it's going to be hard to get somebody to switch over the Triller, barring whatever else that might happen that really benefits them and, and pushes people off TikTok. Who knows what, um, what could happen? It's not impossible. But once people's yeah. behavior is in a groove and you have them, and then you it starts, once again, that network effect, and now it just starts to add up and grow in and of itself so organically. And of course, TikTok is trying to do things like get a celebrities on, right? Um, but a lot of celebrities are actually holding out because they realize their value these days. So it's like, why do I just, I'm not going to just start when I know TikTok will actually pay me to get on in the first place. And exactly. You might get on TikTok and suck for a bit too. So you will be showing your real market value to TikTok. And they're like, oh, well, we don't want, we don't want to pay you that much. So they'll, it might drop the value. So a lot of people are literally strategically holding out just so they can get paid a lot to get on TikTok and, but, and then figure that out. So some of those things are... They're in, they have TikTok on the fringe more than it would be if it was just a free marketplace, none of this other business type of stuff <laughs> in consideration. But yeah, once that t- scale tips, I think it's going to be just so obvious and move so fast. I don't, it'll, it'll be, the days are numbered to me. Um, I think I personally think it's too late for a Triller. And they could be a very strong number two, right? They could be the Pepsi to Coca-Cola. But yeah, um, you guys drink Pepsi and Coca Cola out there heavily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are those, sure, the, yeah. Are those the big two, or yeah. is there anything else out there? Because no, they're, these... they're the big two. Yeah, they're okay, the big two. Cool. Yeah, yeah. But see, even in like drinks, right? Big two. Right. The it it's behavior, right? Um, there's only going to be a couple at the very least, and in, in the long, long term. But however, we're we're so niched today. There, there could be value where we might see a small change in that, where these there's just these platforms that settle on a middle-class success as a tech app, but tech apps are usually looking for billion, which is why they end up usually getting acquired. But yeah, there, there might be some apps that last and just have some kind of a weird one-off utility. They still have a lot of weird websites out there that I didn't even think that would be out there these days. Like, uh, I don't know if you know of eBombs World, but that was probably a website I came across back when I was in middle school and was spending more time than I right. probably should have. And literally just yesterday, I saw a link share from there. And I was like, whoa, y'all are still around? Like, <laughs> but, but you know, once you find a niche, that these sites have the ability to keep reinventing themselves and staying within those niches. So that might be some kind of weird utility that Triller finds in itself. We'll, we'll see. I guess the other, the other comparison I was going to say is that you've got TikTok and Triller. Also, similarly, in the live streaming department in esports, you've got Twitch and Mixer. Obviously, Mixer is owned by Microsoft. It's just on the come up now, and they've taken away some of their big stars like Ninja they've, bought, they've made deals with. But again, they're probably a bit too late to the game to really you know, take on Twitch. Exactly. But hey, a strong number two. And I, I didn't know they took yeah. Ninja. I didn't know they took yeah. Ninja. That, that's usually a great... So from a business standpoint, man, that's usually a great look for like somebody who already has a lot of brand value. Let's say Ninja in this case. And Jay-Z did this with Reebok where you already had the strong number one. And I'm going to go do business with the number two because I'm of more value to them so I can get a bigger deal. So I'm sure they pay him very well. Did you not see that um, Twitch then disgraced themselves um, in response because they, uh, they Ninja's channel is obviously still on active on uh on Twitch and they decide, I think Twitch decided to like broadcast like pornographic videos and images on his channel. What? When he left. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. I remember <laughs> reading this and I was thinking, wow, that's PR nightmare. If you're involved at Twitch, like that's what I was thinking. Like it, it wasn't you... a hack. They did it themselves. <laughs> you're, you're... Well, I'm, that's, that's a bit of a debate, but I kind of, it looks like they might have done it themselves. As a yeah. They probably, done. yeah, they probably yeah, did it. But, <laughs> but you know, how, how low do you want to go? These, you know, these kids that have tuned in to watch him like, 
hey, if they if they have the um the the guise of hey, we got hacked, right? <laughs> they could yeah. just they, that might just be a PR move, right? It's like, hey, yeah, somebody exactly. else did it. Yeah. We just got that, got our name going. But yeah, that's that's crazy. That's interesting. I think people have seen through it, yeah. It, that reminds me of something that where um one of my um friends, her she works in marketing in a completely different industry, um, like med- medical, whatever, something like that. But they lost an award. They, I think they didn't even get into it. Well, yeah, they just, they lost their award. And her boss was like super mad. He's like the director of this however million dollar company. And he, he got drunk that night. He comes home and he tweets how like um, um, angry he was about it. Right. But he wanted to make sure that people saw it, so he boosted the post <laughs> and paid like a hundred dollars wow. for like all his competitors and people to see it. But that, that, that kind of petty is interesting <laughs> when you look at that and what Twitch is doing. I, it's, it's it's a lot of hilarious stories of of people <laughs> leveraging their petty and, and and just to get it seen. But it creates conversation as well. Everything is content these days, man. You know, exactly. you never know the angle that people are going from. So, that's going to grab the headlines at the end of the day, isn't it? That's what, that's what we're going to see, not Mixer. We're going to see, yeah, yeah Twitch to this, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, just before we move away from TikTok, I might as well mention about ByteDance's streaming app now because it's been rumoured since April they're going to make a rival one. And we think there's a lot of reports circling online. They think you might have found the name of it called Yin Yu Bang. So that's Y I N Y U E B A N G. Mm. And, but at the moment, it looks like it's going to target emerging markets primarily like China, for example, um, to try and rival Tencent. Um, it's not available yet on, on the apps, on the app store in Android or iOS in China, but there's a website already up and their slogan translates to listen to popular music, make like-minded friends. So I'm wondering whether they're going to go down the social route, kind of like how, um, L- you know, when L- Spotify first came out, Yin Yu Bang is the name of the, the app. What, what, oh no! I was just saying you made me think of Loom. Because oh right, of yeah, yeah, yeah. The combination yeah. of streaming and, and um, social. But what I was gonna say is, you remember when Spotify had those functions when it first came out? You know, you could you could message people directly on the platform, and it was really integrated with like Facebook and things. It was a lot more social, and they took all those elements away. Yeah. So I think they're going for the model of trying to make it incredibly social, which is interesting. But it wasn't what I was expecting. So I thought it was going to be more of like a, a big mainstream rival to Spotify Apple Music. But I guess they're starting small and focusing on this, on the emerging markets to try and build out from there. Yeah, that's the only way to do it, really. If you want to do things right, it's always going to be a start small to test. And, and if it's completely new business for you, I think that it makes sense, especially to do it in a in a void of emerging markets. So you, once again, already have that behavior. It doesn't, mean, it doesn't matter how cool this thing is in the rest of the world this was the first mover to the marketplace for us yeah. and this is where we're on. So they, it gives them a lock in that space and why not, why not experiment and become better in a space where other people aren't used to this anyway. So they can, don't even have a barrier to judge as much as me. Like, I, I think they're that, quite big though. Cause China has got, you know, 10 cent, like it's, it's still quite a big statement to try and right. go in. And, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. That's very true. Yeah. Yeah, like I can I guess that speaks to how much they also don't need us. Like in America, and we all we often forget how big these other places are and how much infrastructure yeah. other people have in place to to do things as well. But I think that um I think this is going to be something that they probably are going to look to expand, but they're probably going to end up rebranding that name at, at some point. Yeah. All right, like how that works. Just like TikTok was obviously you, TikTok. Yeah, yeah, there we yeah. go. Yeah. yeah. Like, so like TikTok got a different name. Then, of course, they started acquiring everybody else's, um, like, what was it, uh, musically and all Mus- those things. Musically, yeah. Once we got a name we want to settle on and now they go worldwide, it's going to be something very similar. But I don't know, man. This consumer bait and switch is inevitable all the time with these apps. I wonder if people truly see incentive to stay social and um, like music streaming focused at the same time. That's what Loom is saying they're doing. That's a version of what these people are saying they're doing. They're not pushing it as heavily as a part of their narrative as Loom is, but 
so many of these apps, right? They make it as awesome for you, the consumer, as possible until we get you on there, right? Till we hit that network effect, that threshold, and then we start to do some other things, right? <laughs> we take away these features that got you back, here, yeah. but yeah. you know you're already hooked on the crack, so we don't. <laughs> we know you're gonna come back anyway. But they may they may keep the model because obviously we're moving a lot towards the dark social at the moment, which is where obviously most of the networking is now is in like you know private messages and private groups and networking. Like we're moving away from like the open world of like Facebook and Instagram, and everyone's like making their own communities. So yeah. they may be tapping into that you know early because it's still very early days for that. True. That's that's a very good point. That's a very good point considering the fact that right everybody's making things so personal right when we get into the fact yeah it's like almost to the point where it's like in a couple hundred years or however many years people won't always have their predictions on what on that kind of stuff but it just seems like in one way or another people are all trying to live into their home their own world so maybe even the delusional will actually have a reality that they can live in at some point because first we're making everything so personal to us and we're able to access this very specific environment we want to be in and then you start building out things like VR and other things. It'll be interesting to see <laughs> where, like I said, like it, it would be just the world that we have a choice to live in. And we're choosing to go in and out of these different environments that we're building. It is the largest referral like sharing platform now. It's overtaken Facebook. The, the in terms of like the dark social is, is now bigger for sharing than Facebook is. So really? these, these private groups are yeah, taking over now. Mm. Yeah. I like it. I think, yeah, I've got, I've got some stats here. It was like it was 84% in 2016 and then 2018. It's now the largest referral platform for sharing content. So everyone, everyone's moving towards these private communities. So if, if, they get, if these streaming platforms get that right, then, you know, sharing music and, you know, all of these private communities could be a real winner. Yeah, that's going to that's gonna bring more calls for AI in marketing over these years because – it's so hard to message everybody, all these individual communities, but everybody, once again, they want things to be so personal. So of course the, the overarching message would be valuable and a company that wants to be big and connect the masses ultimately still needs to have that overarching brand feel, but maybe not so much. Today it's like, okay, we went from one big message and connecting people because we monopolize attention to one big message and then also the the ground message, trying to cater to all these different specific environments, right? We'll have the people that look like this speaking to y'all to your environment, and we'll just hire all these people to to focus on your environment. But I guess it wouldn't be out of question for at some point for there to be a, a company that almost is completely like, like I said, built off of AI where they're actually able to hit a scale because their marketing yeah. allows them to hit, let's say a hundred thousand different communities and they don't even focus on the overarching message. They just message. It's almost like selling one-to-one -one at scale, right? This is, it'll be that concept. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Right? The, all the private messaging. Yeah. Right. Like our, our private messaging because direct messaging is still the strongest to me. A direct message, direct sales have always been the strongest to me. Even Yeah, SMS is still big, yeah. Well, yeah, but like even if we go to old school, right? SMS is still just mimicking communication and text, that one-on-one. -on -one. So if we look at the door-to-door -door -door salesman or, or car mm -hmm. sales, like someone who's able to speak to you and then handle your objections and give you more context, right? Yeah. As we have built out more technology, we'll have the ability to create more context at scale on an individual level. And that's when that messaging is going to get so important. So it's almost like you're having a digital door-to-door -door salesman. You know what I mean? And people have- Yeah, 100%. Yeah. yeah. That, that is, I think that's, that's the direction we're heading in. That's what Facebook obviously are seeing in a good space right now because obviously they are the gatekeepers for Facebook groups and, and they've got Messenger. Like, I mean, I only keep Facebook because of the groups and Messenger. Like, I don't, mm. I'm not a big fan of the actual- a social network platform and like you know the news feed and things like but yeah. because they have got because i want to be in these certain music networking groups and i want to and i will say when i have messenger i, I stay mm. on the platform i use it Facebook so they're sitting in a good place finds yeah. a way to get back in the best game. of both worlds yeah so yeah uh, but that's it, the direction i think we're heading in so wait we'll definitely i'm sure we'll be talking about this soon but 
wait wait till they continue and continue to integrate themselves into um, into Instagram, right? Yeah, that's <laughs> Facebook isn't that they're not going anywhere. They're they're figuring out in one way or another they're going to control some some aspect of the game. Definitely. So I guess we better get into Spotify because they've been making a few interesting moves. I mean, the biggest one is that they're finally opening this two sided marketplace because record labels can now pay for sponsored ads on the platform. Um, so in particular, they are now offering these, uh, you may have seen the brand new music for you pop-up alerts come up on your phone over the past couple of years when one of, one of, one of your favorite artists released a new song, it gives you an alert. And starting off now in this like beta testing in the US, record labels are gonna be able to pay to push to you these alerts, like notifying when your favorite artist released a song. So it's the first, obviously, this is the first opportunity where they can actually pay to influence, and have pay per click ads. So it's a pretty yeah. big move. That that move is gonna be is gonna be big, uh, especially for Spotify as a company, right? Spotify still isn't making money, right? Yeah. But, which it's not it's not abnormal for a lot of these tech companies because they're try they invest so much in market share and controlling the marketplace. They figure we can make money later, but still. For them to actually find <laughs> a true revenue model and and start to be able to profit is is also just it's, a, it's going to be beneficial for them as a company and allow them to do more more things. And from an artist standpoint, the fact that we're able to reach out to to these people for real for real and get in front of people for real for real on Spotify, I think that's going to be way better. Their ads program is getting better. The ads kind of yeah. weren't necessarily but worth it before but it's still mm-hmm. not great. But for me to just say, even from a sheer visibility standpoint, I'm able to be a, a pop-up essentially, right? There's a lot of power in that. Of course, there's a limitation of how they're starting off where you can only market to people who are already listening to you. Exactly. You're not going to have to attract new fans this way. Yeah. Yeah. Like that. So there, any, any artists out there, right? We're not, we're not there yet where you can truly you, use Spotify natively to build a stand, um, fan base or I would recommend that's the first platform to start off with more Facebook ads to get you into Spotify and using that. Data. Exactly. Yeah. But at the same time, this is the start of it and it might come. And even bigger than that though, well, our one, they're starting this off of record labels. So, okay. It's not even accessible yet. That's always going to happen. Beta. You want to test with the big money and, and certain people. But as they even put, push that down the stream, for an artist to be able to even communicate to people who've listened to them before is still powerful. There's yeah, a lot yeah. in that. Because just to remind people that you would exist in a world where there's so many options is, is definitely meaningful, right? It's another way to let you know. Because I might have missed your media run and all these interviews that you did because that's just the day and age we're in, right? I might have missed some of your Instagram posts or some of these other things. So for me to even just be retargeted while I'm on the platform that ultimately I will be listening to you anyway is powerful because to not be on Facebook and then say, oh yeah, he's an album. I have to go over and remember to go over to Spotify and all that stuff. No, there's yeah, exactly. one barrier. Oh, it's, it's here. Let me, let me click, you know, Beyonce just dropped a new project. Just click a button and instantly listen. It even gratifies that, that, you know, quick instant aspect of things. I think that's going to be something they find to be very useful. I hope it's something that in some ways can get rolled out to uh, indies, right? The lower levels of things. But I think it'll be soon. I mean, they've already tested it for two years. So I'm sure that it's just, this is inevitable, isn't it? It's formality, this beta testing with these labels. Yeah, like, they they know the value know. of it already. They, I don't they must know, know though, right? Like the, the, my issue with it is, one, all right, they've tested it for two years and they're rolling it out to big labels. Cool. But there have been rightfully so and i appreciate it that they've been very methodical about how they allow advertising to work within their platform right yeah. i know a lot of companies and talk to ceos of companies that were trying to do integrations with them that have um like partnerships with every other platform except for spotify one i told him i was like look it's, it's pretty obvious well when you look at the resources that spotify is working with they're probably going to be like i'm going to just do this myself but also yeah. it allows them to be in far more control right they, they're having a very apple approach in, in a lot of um things that they that they do and because you have to make sure that you're not ruining the user the listener's experience 
at the same time. Yeah, exactly. Which reminds me, we did you say can turn it off. Yep, yeah. the users can turn it off. If you've got a premium account, you can disable it, but you have to disable it. It's, it's yep. going to be automatically enabled. So that's the key. It's never, it's never going to start off. None of these features are going to start off with you being able with it automatically turned off. Otherwise, it's you opt know out, about not it, opt right? in. Yeah. yeah, yeah, always opt out. Ask for forgiveness, not for permission. That's always exactly. going to be the model. Yeah, that is the way. Yeah. Yeah, because I was actually talking to uh, Corey the other day, and I was telling him how, like, this, this kind of stuff, right? That that behavior, a lot of times, is just going to be, no, I'm just going to keep keep clicking X, right? As opposed to going in and turning the whole feature off, because I had yeah. like, my this example of myself, if I had this alarm, um, where that would remind me of one of the calls that I was supposed to put him on back when we had a system where I had to get on like Zoom, and then he gets on Zoom. Yeah. And when I created the alarm by mistake, I had it on every single day. So every single day at 8.59 p.m. Eastern time, it would go off. But I just kept swipe. All right. It's off. Leave it, yeah. <laughs> Until yeah. one day my girlfriend was just like, bro, cut that shit off. Like, stop because she got tired of it running. But like that's that's a, a, a small case study for how user behavior works. Right. We're going to opt for the easiest way out. For as long as possible, yeah. you'll get you'll get this alert. You'll either go to the album or, or track, or you'll close it. You would then go, "Oh, I'm going to go through and turn that off." You know, you're, you're just going to leave it. You're not going to go into your settings and then go through and like, "I don't want to see these again." Because you, you know, if it's targeting artists you actually like, you're going to want to see them anyway. Exactly, so, and that's the more important part. Because they, since that barrier of using of you know behavior is already there, they can it gives you a space to work within as long as you don't violate that you'll make sure it's still on because once you get people turning it off now you kill the long-term value of it and yeah. that's the bigger check that they'll be looking for but the re- reason i look at it when it comes to an indie standpoint because indies don't necessarily have the same rules right indies won't be as methodical possibly right there are gonna be a lot of people who try to like all right let me just blast or you know don't use it as artfully so they'll probably have some restrictions into how they allow um, it to be used. It's just because uh, there is plenty of value in the long tail, though. It always goes back to that, even though it's not this big one off record company um, payment to use this platform in the advertising budget. You have, I don't know, one million artists trying to spend a hundred dollars and thinking they'll blow up off of it. And you add that up, it's a hundred million dollars. Like that, it's, it's still a, <laughs> a very, viable income stream but it'll be interesting to see how that rolls out over time but I, this is one of the more meaningful spotify updates in a long time and it gets even bigger because i've been doing some research like i was like looking into their presentation about this you know about their, their the third quarter of this year and the plans moving forward so the founder daniel Eck was saying that like 28 march 2018 spotify for artists had a hundred thousand artists on the platform now there's 465,000 and they account for 80% of all the streams on the platform. What and those then numbers again? So 100, so 100,000 tw- March, 2018. Now it's 465,000 and they account for 80% of the total streams on Spotify. But more importantly, their goal is to, their current target is for 1 million artists to live off their music. And they're looking into a lot of new ways to monetize the artist to fan relationship. So they're mm-hmm. looking at, he has said they're already looking at, micro like micro payments and tipping artists as well so they're actively testing these features so we're going to see them you know probably next year it's just yeah, the first man. of a long line so this is, this is such massive news because they're finally opening up this you know this artist to fan relationship how to monetize it like the two-sided marketplace on spotify is open now this is just the beginning and it's and so it's important because the power of specialization and owning that space they have so many possibilities to really get into that apple music doesn't seem to be thinking a part of because that's just not their full focus. It's just that, one of their brands. Yeah. It's just, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Circle was actually talking about that. Um, brought that up to me. Yeah. I wasn't thinking about it. And, um, but yeah, just, it's interesting. Like when you own and that's your specialization, of course you can go far deeper. It's just that simple. So I think that that's really cool with that idea of having 1 million artists as a goal to live off um, their music and the tipping feature that's that that kind of that excites me and the tipping thing is so much more of a revenue stream than i think these people have realized one of course yeah, tipping, crowdfunding is big yeah Patreon. yeah 
like TikTok, right? The money is getting made on TikTok right now. Yeah, just of course. From, yeah. from the tips. Obviously, t- Twitch was the first platform that I had ever encountered that was really doing it at scale. Now, this is mm-hmm. something not even foreign, basically, when it comes to China. China, when it comes to monetization of a tech platform and all these microwaves, the stickers, the tip, like their their users are so trained for it. It's ridiculous the amount of money that people yeah. get, get paid based on, you know, I'm going to buy you a whole bunch of stickers and all that kind of stuff. But and, and that's why I think TikTok is so early in doing it at the beginning of their platform, right? Because obviously it's oh, um, like competing in that space and, and have dealt you know, with China and all that stuff. But tipping is going to be, yeah, I don't know. That's just been one of the most interesting sense, really. places, right? It's, 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 always, your, it's part of your culture anyway. It's, it's integrated into, into the US society. Like it's, you're right. That's it makes, funny. It makes, sense. it makes sense to, you know, incorporate it on the online world. Why did that never transfer over so much? That's funny. Because it wasn't so, until I became a, 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 a was it a waiter that I realized that tipping is so much of an American thing and not necessarily a <laughs> rest of it was, the world. Wasn't, thing. It wasn't until I went there that I was like, well, "This is how it's, it's totally different to what I'm used to." Yeah, trying to work out how much. So how much do you give? Like asking my friends, like, "So what do I do in this situation?" Like, so you you want me to give you more money? Is that what? <laughs> I was just trying to work. Yeah, it was like all new concept to me. So yeah. it's um, interesting. Yeah, I think um. Yeah, that, that tipping thing is something to watch, though, because I it blew my mind when I, I used to watch games on TikTok a little bit. I'm not TikTok, Twitch back in the day. Um, but then it, a lot of it was just doing some research for another project, a tech platform I was trying to build out. And it was a tech music platform, actually. And they um, I, there was a story and I saw like this girl got like a thirty thousand tip dollar tip, right? It was like one dollar, five dollar, one dollar, three dollar, yeah. and it was thirty thousand dollars. And I was like, "Holy shit!" I was like, "This thing is." Cr-. And and then after like seeing that, I found out that wasn't a a, a one off thing, right? Yeah. There's other people getting similar big tips. That's just a crazy world to me, man. But it but it truly is probably going to be far more normal than than we expect. It's the best for it's the best revenue stream for us. It's going to be because you know you can act, you can set, you'll be able to set like different tiers like you do on Patreon. Like you know you can start influencing what they create and what they talk about. It's just the whole bringing back to the personal one-on-one engagement. It's just going to be so much more powerful. Mm. So yeah, I think it's a very it's a very exciting time for Indies. I think for, for the moves that Spotify are making, and particularly with the the other feature we're going to talk about, which is the Spotify's Canvas video looping tool which is the visuals you see sometimes in replace of the album artwork. And they're rolling it out now to more artists. You, if, you're, if you're part of Spotify for Artists, you can now like request an invite and join the wait list to get this feature. And what's good about it is that not only can you do it for upcoming releases, you can also go back and add canvases to your old releases as well. So it's a whole new way to like communicate your brand and your story because you've got three to eight seconds to create this visual that can link more into who you are as a person. Like, you can get really creative with it. You could you could tell a story through like three to eight second clips of all your different songs. Like you could start your very first release could have the start of the story, and you could just run this like narrative throughout if you really wanted to, or you could just do everyone separate. Like there's just so much room and like growth for it. Yeah, I think Spotify is starting to get it right, man, because of these last um, few announcements and things that I've been hearing. But first, I, before I get into that. One, if you aren't clear, um, anybody who's listening on what feature we're talking about, one the only project I've seen it on so far was uh, is Trippy Red. It's an exclamation point. That's the name of the project, so I can't really mm-hmm. give you a name. It's just an ex- exclamation point, Trippy Red with two Ds. But essentially, yeah, you're listening to the track, and usually it has an album cover or a picture there. But he used actual fans for his project. So he had fans that use his filter of like your, like your IG filter or something where you can look like them or look like anything else. They, his fans had his tattoos and he took those fans and put them on his project cover. So that was like a cool activation for them, right? It was a cool social thing. But like that right there, that small level of communic- communication, because I think right now you can only have that one picture on it has to be the exact same video, moving video for the entire album. I don't think it can be like track to track dedicated yet, which probably uh, is... only only some of the tracks will be. It depends if you release them as a single or not. Yeah, so the well, singles yeah. will be different. Yeah, right, but you can't right, do right. the whole album yet. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I, don't, I don't think so anyway. But right, right. 
but it'll get to that point. Like it, it'll definitely exactly get to that point. turn the whole narrative through. That would be would be like really cool. Yeah, and obviously the move towards visuals is interesting because obviously you question the future of the album artwork if we're going moving towards this video sort of like integration. Like. So this is what I was thinking was interesting because I want to know what you think about that because when I look at a lot of these other moves, it's far more about the advancement of music and advancing the user experience and the uh, artist's ability to communicate that exp um, expression, which of course in, um, enhances the user experience than before when it was like, we're trying to figure out how to gain as much market share, find revenue models and, and build mm -hmm. because this is the world was going because they wanted to get into video heavy at one point. I don't know if you remember that. They started doing music videos, didn't they, on their like, vertical ones and that, yeah. Yeah, they did, but they stopped focusing on, on the music videos, right? Yeah. And I think they saw, hey, this isn't, this is an entirely different business technically. It's like sometimes things can seem more of the same business than they actually are, right? Because you, once again, that ability to go in depth and handle, like they, there's so much that hasn't been done and innovated in the music listening spirit experience alone a video business just because there's so much video and on all these other platforms can be a distraction from it. So I, I love to hear how, of course, these are micro moves that ultimately might end you in the same place, but there's so much innovation that is sound, uh, is happening and cool steps that I'm hearing, like moves like this that are happening in the meantime that haven't been done before because they're just enhancing the music versus just trying to get in another game. That's how I see it right now. They're clearly taking influence, inspiration from GIFs and how popular they are on social media because obviously these are very short visuals and I, I think, you know, yeah. in the future, you might rather have an album artwork, you might have like a GIF instead, like a moving GIF might be the album artwork instead and then you have the longer visuals when you actually go on to the now playing, now playing view of the song. But what surprised me the most is the, the actual like stats they've got for however much of an impact it's had for artists. Like they've said really? that, yeah, they said that it's increased streams by up to 120% and increased sales by up to 114%. For these artists wow and these, these are public figures they've said yeah so because obviously i think they've been testing it for the part since january and i i guess they've decided oh, actually these figures have made, we should roll out further like, i didn't think it'd be that impactful hmm. but apparently so yeah i think one well how long are the visuals because i i've watched them obviously so three I, I three to eight it. seconds three so eight it can seconds. be it can be three seconds or it can be up to eight yeah That's it, and man. a lot a lot of ones i've seen are like um there's three different versions. Like there's ones that like constantly loop and you can't, you can try and work out, work out where the cut is because they, they're so fluid. You can't tell where the yes. cut is. That's what uh, I, like that, I like that one a lot. Yeah. yeah well, <laughs> Cause the, I was going to say the one that I saw was, it seemed like it was so much longer, but I was probably like four yeah. tracks in until I realized, yo, they're just showing the same people over and over again, but it was super yeah. clean. It was super clean. But I think that's something to watch. Right. And I only say that because one, there could be a sense of novelty, right? And because that's not existing anywhere else on the platform, that might help produce those sales. It's something that people aren't used to. It's for communicating effect, but once things even out and they have more people doing that, I don't know how much that would increase sales versus another project, right? It might create a new medium, but it ultimately increasing sales, not increasing, well, technically streams can be sales, but in increasing the yeah, streams. Yeah, you get the idea, yeah. <laughs> yeah, increasing the streams. Maybe if somehow that, that long, in the long term, creates more incentive to be on Spotify as a platform, and maybe as they continue to add features, it just keeps people, yeah, off other places and, and allow people to have more time spent on Spotify, just period, right? Your, your time on the platform, maybe there would truly be a long-term increase in sales, but short term, the, the, the sample size is so small. I don't know how much to, how much weight to put in that just yet, just because of the, the novel part of it alone. Yeah. What, what I do like is that you have, you know, some of them are just using bits from music videos of their music videos, but some of them are Smart. actually like, a lot more you get a lot more meaning out of some of them than you would do with them behind the lyrics stuff because you're actually you can, you're seeing what you're interpreting is it's happening in front of you on the screen so rather than just reading the lyrics and making your own interpretations you're actually seeing a bit more of an insight into you know the, the, what the artist was you know thinking when they wrote the song or the vision for the song or the track meaning and there's just a lot mm. of different creative ways you can do it yeah so you, you can just take the music video where you can create something exclusive for it and it can really just enhance listeners experience but 
most of the time I listen with my phone locked, so I don't even see these loops that are going on. That's the other side, but exactly. it's interesting. That's the, the thing, right? Where I said there's the difference between short term and long term of how it really affects things. Because if you are saying to me, yo, this not only makes people want to see, check out the project because this thing is just cool and novel. Maybe they're now not just listening passively. People are more likely to look and listen. Then Mm -hmm. there's a true impact to Spotify as a company and ultimately the music that gets consumed on that platform. That'll be interesting. But yeah, I I like what you said about the additional form of expression because the, the example I had, Trippy Red, he used it as something additional and that was really cool to see. And if people don't get lazy and just take music video clips and create something, right? Use mm-hmm. that as additional space to communicate. It could get really cool. And now, like you said, but it, it could, it might not replace completely, right? Because we have other photos and platforms, but people yeah. will be now thinking about our moving album artwork, just as artwork, just as much as they're thinking about their static album artwork. That's, that's cool. I think that's dope. And tagging on to your point you mentioned earlier about you know the album and the idea that eventually you could have every album track have different ones like you could tell the entire story through the album that that sounds really cool to me like you know yeah. if you're saying oh like there's this um, special version of of the album story the only on Spotify if you go and watch all the visuals like that would encourage people to go to that platform to listen if you've made an exclusive sort of like story for your album on Spotify only you're going to get listeners to go and watch it there if they're big fans. Yeah, man. I, All the promo I you've got it. for that is great. Yeah. I love it, man. Look, man, these graphic designers are going to become more and more important. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, animators, all that. They're going to, artists are going to need you've one got of those. You've got a potential like 90 second story you can tell over an album then. If, you, if you're using the eight seconds for each one, you've got about 90 seconds. Mm-hmm. Which is you're more, that's all you need, really. Like, you can tell a cohesive story. Yeah. Yep. So I think, I, think it's, I think it's got a lot of scope. It just needs a, it needs some refining, but definitely, like, I think it's a good good feature. I'm surprised how impactful it has been. I'm not sure how inflated the stats have been, but I guess, I guess there must be some truth to them. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah. So moving on to YouTube, um, a couple of stories from them. The big one that I think it's kind of gone underreported is the fact that they're going to end the support for third-party pixel tracking like, early next year. Mm-hmm. A lot of the marketers have been picking up on it, but no one's really got into what it could mean, you know, for the actual advertisers on a more small level like for artists in particular in the music industry because obviously a lot a lot of artists run ads on facebook and instagram with the view of getting youtube views and subscribers and the fact you're not gonna be able to see if you're using your facebook pixel the fact you're not gonna be able to see the impact it's had is gonna be a real real bummer yeah yeah i mean i think that that sucks from a marketer standpoint i think why you don't hear more people talking about it is that reason that so many people are on Facebook and Facebook has made that so easy. And when it comes to YouTube, they don't even think about it. They don't even know about it. There's very few people who know what a pixel is outside of Facebook pixels. Right. (laughs) Yeah. You know um, that they are the ones who introduced that concept at scale to so many people. So um, that, you know, people who aren't even thinking about that type of thing before. So I think that's part of the, the lack, of this and i think maybe nah, i don't know i can't say youtube probably um saw that or looking at it that way but it won't be as much of a, a war people because people won't know what they're missing we're not gonna hear much right. about this um from an artist standpoint or just a, a a general level um consumer standpoint but it does suck to me because obviously look as a marketer i'm trying to track every single thing that i than I can yeah, do, exactly. but, I, but I'm, I will say myself though, I haven't used any third party pixels on YouTube. I just haven't gotten to the point where I was doing a campaign that large and dedicated on YouTube where I wanted to get that deep into the details. Um, but I don't know, man. That these, <laughs> the, it's not, I want to get your take on it because that doesn't mean I, it's, I struggle to like understand fully the consequences of it. But what I found interesting was the fact that the cookies, the pixels, like can't even track mobile apps. So the fact that most people watch YouTube on an app and you can't even track that anyway, I think that's why Google are making their own version of the tracking because you can't do it with like the pixels. Wait, so explain that part to me again because I hadn't heard um, that. I remember seeing a note, but what was that? 
So the, apparently, the, the, a lot of the pixels they can't track like you know integration into mobile apps. If you if you're going into a mobile application, it, it can't track that. So that's why Google made their own version because obviously most oh. YouTubers, most people watch YouTube on on the app. It's like seventy percent of users watch it on the app, and these oh. pixels can't track that. Okay. So that's why they're making their own version of it. The ads data, the ads data hub, which they've made, is their version of being able to track this. Okay. Well, to me, actually. What I'm thinking and when I hear this just from my interpretation, this makes it far easier for me to to integrate and use Google. So it sounds like I'll, Google Ads is becoming more comprehensive, which is something that mm-hmm. I've hated about them in comparison to Facebook. But you can't. Facebook is a unicorn right now. And just as far as their level of in-depth um, ad platform to offer to just general level consumers. But like this makes them more comprehensive and makes them, them more in-house and easier to use and see more in-depth pixel data and add mm-hmm. that tracking so i'm i'm actually happy about that because the third party pixel okay. is a thing in itself these third party pixels a lot of them charge you right um because they're a service how do they make money if you're just a pixel business right um a lot of them are dealing with that even though some of them are just collecting the data and, and, and use that as a revenue stream as well but for me and and even as someone working with artists and communicating to artists I would be, I'm excited about that actually from a standpoint of, look, now I might be able to teach artists how to use Google Pixels and find that same value or similar, right, that I could find in Facebook because look, the, the third, especially for an artist, let's just keep it there, right? Yeah, it's quite having, complicated, yeah. Having to deal with another level of information, another level of integration as an individual artist is just a lot. It's too much, right? Artists are yeah, exactly. dealing with enough. Yeah. So I like that they're making it simple and bringing it in house and revealing something I feel like that they should have been able to do for a long time anyway, considering who they are, right? Google, come on now. Yeah. Y'all, y'all yeah. really started this digital ad based platforms. Like y'all really got that popping. So <laughs> they should be, they should have been had something like this. And the other story from YouTube is their new partnership with Merch Bar to sell merchandise. Obviously, you mentioned in our conversation before that there are other companies like uh, Teespring that you can sell merch on already, but this is the first one that's focused just on the artists. So it's just YouTube is now starting to pay more attention to its music and it's really sort of concentrating on that because Merch Bar is it's just, just for artists. So the idea mm-hmm. is that you will be able to go on the, on the uh, artist page on YouTube and you'll be able to buy the merch in the shelf um, directly on the platform. And it's a... Yeah. I, don't know what, I don't know what your take on it is, but I think it's interesting that they're actually focusing on the first artist, you know, first artist made merchandise platform. Well, I think any other player in the game is beneficial because all there is is Teespring right now. And Teespring is trash. It's the worst imaginable user experience that you can get in 2019. It's unbelievable right. that that is the user experience in 2019 and they happen to have the sole partnership with YouTube, which is massive, right? I read there's a, there's a few more I read, though. It wasn't just Teespring now. I haven't seen anybody else. Now, they might have launched, because when they launched mm. last year, it was just Teespring. I'm sure they're going to roll out other people. So there are, I, read, I wrote it in the newsletter. There's a few, there, is a, there is a few more, I who believe, else? now. I'm now going to get the list up, because yes, you know, I, was only, I was only aware of Teespring, but then when I read about Merch Bar, I also read into there was actually more of them. So let's just okay. see. Yeah, let's definitely get me on that because I need to find some ideas. So there are FanJoy and CrowdMade and there's a couple others as well that I don't have listed, but there are okay. a few more alternatives. But the idea of this one is this is the first artist one. And if, what I think is most important really is, is the bigger picture and the fact that YouTube is really starting to push out and dedicate more attention to YouTube music and the artists. The fact that YouTube music is now a default pre-installed app on Android phones rather than Google Play and the fact that YouTube Music has now got its own algorithm-generated playlists, such as to rival Spotify Discover Weekly and Release Radar, they really are putting a lot more attention into gaining subscribers for YouTube Music, and that's got to be a good thing for artists. Very much so. I, I, so YouTube Music, like most people, the, the numbers when it comes to music is, is massive from YouTube. In so many countries, YouTube is the number one platform for music, yeah. even though... We don't think about it that way. It's still adding up number-wise to be the most uh, listened-to platform. So they've been trying to get in the business. 
for a long time, obviously. And I, I wasn't aware that they're defaulting it now, which is interesting. I'm hoping people aren't paying, having to pay for it just yet. As far as, well, you do, they do. If you want the ad free, I think they you get a free trial, don't you? Yeah. Well, they start, yeah. they did a free trial version once before, which I tried out and it was actually really cool. Um, but that was like years ago. I'm sure there's been a lot of advancements since there. They might be going the Spotify route though, right? Cause you know, you're already having these people listen. So they might say, look, all right, now we're just going to create a better user experience. That would be, that's the steps that I would take, right? We're going to create a better user experience for you first and mm-hmm. just make you have to pay for ad through ad dollars. That's how people are already listening to music and having to deal with ads and things like that anyway. So take that time, get them behaviorally invested. And then after they're behaviorally invested, now we can figure out deeper ways to, to get in some revenue, just like so many other platforms. Um, we'll figure out yeah, how do we they're, like, they're making, solidify. They are making these moves, obviously, because you've got the fact that, you know, default app and now it's, um, they've got algorithm generated playlists. They've got this merchandise partnership. Soon they might have, you know, buy tickets directly in the app or crowdfunding might be incorporated directly into the, into the app, See? you know, some tipping. Right? It's just same Perfect. as Spotify. It's the journey. It's, this is where we're heading. I think this is, that's why I think it's so important for the artists. It's very exciting because you two are doing a similar thing to Spotify. Yeah, man. It's, it's it definitely the, the journey. There's going to be so many artists that are like, yo, man, I wish I had this stuff when I was, you know, coming up in like five years. The, the, the things that are going to exist then is going to be just like when I left my college, I look back, the things that they have in place. I'm like, shit, I wish they had these things while I was there. But to bring it back to merch, because that was how we brought this up. Yeah. The fact that Merch Bar, they essentially position themselves as merch discovery, which I have two feelings about. One, nobody is looking to just discover a random artist's merch, right? Yeah. Not yeah. yet, at least. And so it's like to be to talk about merch discovery, I, I don't know if that's more selling a vision than the reality at this point. Well, I feel like that's what it is. Right. Because if I'm if I like Marshmallow because Marshmallow is on a platform, then I'm going to go in and I'm looking for Marshmallow. I came here probably because he told me was, my stuff his stuff was on here and then I looked at it. But that did get me on site. Right. So maybe I do feel around a little bit. Maybe I happen to do that. But on top of that, <clears throat> now you add enough people doing that. Maybe it does get to a point where the ease of creation of merch Right. Because there's so many people, um, companies that wholesale and allow us to drop ship and things like that. Maybe considering the entire thing, artist brands become like the new norm. Right. Of Mm. a lot of the off brands that we wear. Right. Because there's so many off brands that people wear or, you know, brands on the way to the big, got the big, big brands. And then there's all these other little brands that people wear that still make a massive amount of money. But people aren't thinking about it when they think about are you a relevant brand or not, right? You're not Gucci, you're not Louis, you're not this popular uh, Sean John or like any of that stuff, but you're still a very, very sustainable um, business that just has um, clothing. Now that might be a true thing for artist merch. Like people might actually default towards a site like this as artist merch i'm sure that's what their goal will be what i like is just the fact that they're focused on artists only and that's probably going to actually focus on the brand experience more that's where you know i'm at the end of the day it's always gonna come back there so teespring and just so many jobs drop shipping sites right they leave artists in a position where they have to sacrifice a lot of their expression and how and how the fan consumes that other piece of them it's just a t-shirt but it comes in a you know yeah. regular ugly little box or something like that versus being able to control that experience even more so. And ultimately, if that's their business, they'll probably get to the point where you can control that experience and offer more at a lower price. That's going to be really cool for artists at some point. It's early right now. So, you know, we'll see how that how long that um, actually takes, because obviously they're also is an invite only platform. Every artist can't get on it. Everybody always starts off with the big boys, right? Yeah. <laughs> quicker, quicker revenue, more revenue, create something sustainable. And we know there's going to be this driver of business that comes and go top down. That's how so many people start, but I don't know, man. Um, 
yeah, we'll just have to watch. I'm just excited. I'm, I, bro, I, let me know. You got to send me an email with these other people that you mentioned because yeah, I am we'll definitely do. looking for alternatives to Teespring, but still have that feature. But as you say, it's a step in the right direction. And just to clarify that right now, you have to be in the US, you have to have an official artist channel and you have to have merch to our store account as well to do this. But as we're and saying, we're going to be invited. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But as we're saying, though, what we're, what we're mainly trying to talk about here is that, you know, these are very exciting things moving forward. And we're obviously going to keep you updating these newsletters like throughout, you know, the coming months. Like we're going to be, you know, hands on giving you the, the advice and keeping up stable these new elements as they roll out because there's so much going to happen in the next like six to 12 months of all these platforms all of them true because facebook have also been very busy um quite a few new different features um i don't know if you checked out any of them but the responsive ad feature where they called it multiple text optimization so you can create several different headlines ad copy and description and then Facebook's AI will determine which one's going to be most effective and then roll that one out. So you could write, if, if you're not sure which one's best for your ad copy, they'll decide which one they think is going to be best and push it out and test it. I love it, right? This is more yeah. of that door-to-door salesman model that I talked about, right? Doing that yeah. at scale. Because, of course, you can test copy now, but it's more so... All right, you A, B test, right? You're running two ads. They have different copy, those small iterations, and you see what works. But using this AI, this extra level, that's going to be a lot less assumption involved because there's still some assumption of what did it, even if I just change one word, I guess. I, I do know based on the isolated variables. This ad says, uh, listen to my music now. And this other mm-hmm. um, thing says, music out now or something or listen to my music today let's just keep it that simple instead of now we say today exactly yeah ultimately we'll be able to do that a lot faster and get far better results and 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 tap into a recommendation engine based on the direction that facebook is going that part super excited versus having to do that manually and just in the back end as a marketer like starting up the campaign and having to do those details it's still a little it's a little tedious, right? It's yeah, not exactly, the hardest yeah. thing in the world, but yeah. it's already tedious. So even from a workload perspective, it's really cool to see that. But making it that simple and how it's done so far, how they're looking to do it, I'm actually super excited about this because this is going to allow us to tap into just so many different people and so many different audiences without with, with doing less work, right? The, ha- the fact that you have somebody that doesn't work at a big corporation right that has access and can tap into this level of comprehensive marketing and data is is always mind-boggling to me when it comes to facebook's platform so this is just yet another thing that's going to be a game changer i don't let people realize because they already still don't use a b testing as much as they should until its full extent but this is a game changer from from a pr standpoint you know we, we live and die by every word so it's nice to have that option you can test different ones if you're really struggling that obviously you no, know, because words are so important like your your title and your ad copy is is like pivotal so the fact that you can just the fact that ai will test the different ones it's just yeah it's such a you know makes your life a lot easier the only annoying thing is that so it's going to be going to be available within the next couple of weeks but you won't be able to see how each of the different texts did you won't be able to compare the different ones yet which is a bit, a bit annoying, but I'm sure that will roll out eventually. So they're showing you what it, they're showing you. No, they're going to move towards the result, right? They're going to give you the proper result, but they're not going to tell you that, hey, this how each, yeah, they'll, yeah, they'll yeah, give you the, the best one, but they're not going to tell you in, in, in the demos. They actually, they are showing that, but they've said they won't be available upon release immediately. Yeah, that does. So, say. Yeah. But you're still getting the best one. You, you know, you, they're giving you the best one. You just won't have to see how much better it did compared to other ones. But yeah. obviously, it's, it's going to roll out eventually, and then you'll be, you'll be able to get a lot stronger at your at do, writing your ad copy in the future if you know which ones worked best last time. You've learned, and you're just going to carry on doing the same, repeat the same model. So it's, it's a very powerful tool. It's, it's, it's good. The same yeah. with their, um, their new open search feature. So you know how we have ads in the news feed in the marketplace? Now, when you go to the search bar and you type in something, you'll see the same ad appear if it's relevant to your target audience and the topic of conversation. So 
I'm not quite sure how this is going to impact artists so much yet. But if you are searching for a particular artist, you are going to see their adverts come up in the search bar before you've even found them. So it's another, another way of communicating your product. So. Yeah, I don't think that'll affect artists too much right now, for sure. I can't see it to, um, where I would, yeah, I can't see any period where I would be recommending that as a platform, maybe for retargeting purposes at, at most, just yeah. to create that omnipresence of, hey, okay, cool. You listen to my music or you discover my ads on this platform and then just what you happen to be searching on on Facebook, you will pop up and you see us. We're not trying to get you to listen this way. You just see us and remind you we exist. But because that's how you can leverage Google. Like I've worked with several companies that that leverage Google ads and um, YouTube ads in that same way, more as a searchability thing. But Facebook, I don't even, like, I personally don't, I don't search anything on Facebook really for the most part. No, the, right? the only time I would is to go and search nice to like their page to get updates in the feed. That's the only time I do it. Yeah, exactly. All right. Like I'm, I'm, and I'm, and it's so specific when I am doing it, I'm not as personally affected by that, but I guess but you would see their ad in there. If you did search, right. You would see I would their ad. see it. That's why I'm saying it's more of a retargeting just to remind you I exist yeah. versus trying to hope you get driven towards a specific action. That's at most of what I can see right now, but it's nothing I would have any, in any short term, even long term, I can see, I don't know if I would ever invest, I mean, ever recommend an, an indie, especially to even look at that. There's already too many other options with bigger yeah, exactly. impact. I wouldn't say that one's going to be too relevant just yet. But yeah, the, the options there, it, just, it, it displays exactly the same as a news feed ad. You can have a single image, you could have a video or a carousel, which is weird. Having that big thing on the search is going to be, <laughs> it's going to be there. So yeah. we we'll see it in the future. That's why it's going to be very good for if you're selling products, you know, yes. other co- yeah. So oh, hell yeah. For products. Yeah. It's so be it's going to be great. So yeah, it's just something to bear in mind. If you see it, that's what it is. That's its capabilities. Use it if you want. And the other thing for Facebook is their new live video publishing tools, which I really like because when you do a live and you, you go on, you do Facebook Live or Instagram Live, you're never quite sure if it's going to go the way you want it to go and it's going to look the same, and it's going to look right. So you can now do like a test rehearsal. So you can invite your other page admins or editors to check that your video is working properly and it's all you know framed correctly and, and it's all looking as it should be before you actually go live, which I really like because you, know, you could do a whole video and then be like, Oh shit! Is the lighting's bad, or it hasn't come out, or it's or it's laggy, or you yep. know, this person's not, this person's muted. Like, so you, you can check all these things, and also you can now also uh, trim the video as well, so you can cut off the beginning and the end, which is always again a very useful tool when you then repost it. Yeah, simple, but hey, better quality. Little things, yeah, it's yeah, just, just the little things. So yeah, I think that's instantly valuable. And the other thing you're going to like as well is the, the creator studio features, which you discovered recently. Yeah. On yeah. yeah. So the native Instagram scheduling, loyalty insights to show returning viewers to your videos. It shows you like which people come, keep coming back continuously. And it also mm. has got this new distribution metric that allocates a score to your videos. So they base that score on one minute views, average minutes watched and retention of the audience and gives you a score based on how each of the videos have been performing. Man, so I freaking love Facebook. On you use these <laughs> tools, yeah. Get on Facebook Creator Studio. There's a lot I of stuff you can do Facebook, in there you don't even man. know about. Yeah, I mean, look at least on look that aspect of Facebook. I love like from the marketing side because yeah, like even back when I first discovered that you can essentially your your retargeting for your Instagram is built in, right? Instagram is a built-in page where you don't have to have pixels on your Instagram right? To retarget yeah. on there and, and things like that. That was huge. And they're constantly moving towards uh, being the new website for people, for real, for real, mm-hmm. right? That's essentially what they're becoming. And even as Facebook is less relevant, right? The Instagram is going to become the new Facebook in some sort, right? So like, that's yeah. why I don't encourage people to say, okay, get rid of Instagram completely, especially if you know how to use these ads, and understand the information that's coming because man, the, the loyalty thing, that is great. Like yeah, you, definitely. You yeah. see people who are loyal to my comment content. That's more than just regular first level retargeting. All right. 
I get to actually see and get data on the people who are like their frequency on my page. That's a different level of interaction and there's a different level of customization and attention that I can give those people. For, you can DM them then as well. I can DM them. Like, yeah. So as an artist, like I could really be like, yo, man, I really appreciate your support. It's exactly. kind of, it's semi what they offered on SoundCloud, right? But it's um, even, it's, just, it's better. I already, the things that I'm hearing about it is just better. So yeah, like I could DM them. I could now say, I could offer them specials. Shout them out, tickets, bring them alive. Shout them out, all these things just yep. right from the data versus me even having to run a contest to do these things and all that kind of stuff, right? So it's it's even cheapening fan loyalty and engagement because when people when fans see this type of interaction, right? Now that I know these are the people who are worth doing it with. And now that I do it with these people and I know they're going to speak for me and I can show people that these, these interactions as well. So whether it's like a free merch or I go visit them or one-on-one, whatever that thing is, the ability to document it as well, those things actually create stronger fans. Funny enough, when fans just see you treating other fans right, even if they aren't the one that you're, you're talking with. So that in itself is, is going to um, create for better community and culture and be great for marketing as well. But yeah, that, that loyalty thing, that's the, well, Instagram is immediately, like the only reason I found out about it, uh, like when I told you, right, Corey had told me, he had just found out about it. Yeah. And, and, and I'm and like, and we've been both posting a lot more IGTV videos. So that, that right there is just like, yo, bro, this is- Game changer. Game changer immediately for yeah. us. And then you add on the fact that um, there are some apps that allow for automated, IGTV. I'm not IGTV. Um, just IG scheduling. IG posts. Yeah, 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 IG posts. But my reservation with them has always been just the fact that it seems that Instagram throttles the interactions with those things, right? And it all makes sense, right? We want to increase your time on our site because so you're not even going on the site if you're just auto scheduling. And we also want to increase, you know, and so. All right, now I'll, I'll change the points. So it's, if we can't, if we know that people really want this thing, at least come through us to do it so we can gather yeah. some other form of data, right? And we have some other form of benefit from that. So I think there's going to be less throttling of that interaction and suppressing organic reach, which is already tough, right? So if you, so there's going to be less of that when you go through their native um, app, which, um, yeah, I'm just super excited about, man. Like I've, I've already yeah. started using that since I discovered it, well, or was told about it. I don't want to be Christopher Columbus and that was like I discovered something first, but but since I've been on it, right, uh, I've been I've been using it a lot. And this is gonna be another thing that just makes it so much easier. The creator studio. And it's funny, when obviously I found out about it, it almost became a duh moment. Like why didn't they have this already? I didn't even know that I was. Well, yeah, I didn't it. think about it either. I haven't even. <laughs> yeah, I haven't even noticed it until recently. Like, <laughs> yeah, was, it's like y'all should have been doing this. It's the same way that YouTube has their creator studio. They yeah. should have had that, right? Even though they're ahead in that ad game, that part of things and that the content output side is what YouTube wins in, right? Controlling your content and all these other things, and that. But it also shows me. Long term, Facebook is going to get really interesting when it comes to copyrights, how YouTube can get very annoying when it comes to copyrights. Um, yeah. They're so serious about it. Yeah. Facebook is getting there. They're, yeah. you give it some time. They will be there. IGTV is longer form content. It doesn't make sense to really, get co- you know, do copyrights on these short videos back when they had 15 second videos and even necessarily 60 second videos because right. it's not full content, but IGTV up to 10 minutes. Yeah. You're, you're. As a mm, go ahead. interesting example, I couldn't even so my I couldn't even post my brother's single lyric video on his own Instagram page. He got he got copyright blocked. His really? own single, yeah. Wow, why? But I don't know. But and as another <laughs> comparison, yeah. I but I can I can post my the producer I manage. I can I can post his lyric video on my own IGTV page, but I can't mm. post my brother's single on his own IGTV page. Wow. So I really can't figure that one out. See? I mean, Makes no sense. 
I mean, another thing that lends towards the fact that they're going to get serious about this is the fact that you can monetize content on YouTube. I mean, on Facebook already. Right. Yeah. So once monetization steps into the game and people can make money, that's when the copyright things becomes more of a serious thing to to mandate. Right. Um, so when you add the longer form content coming to IGTV, if it starts on Facebook, you can pretty much be assured at some point Facebook is going to try to figure out how we can get it on to IGTV. So 100 percent. That's going to be something to watch out for. That's going to suck considering how, like, I don't know how they're going to deal with repost culture because that's such a strong part of it, right? Uh, in Instagram, yeah. I hope they don't ruin that part of the platform. And it definitely will suck for me because <laughs> um, I had definitely leveraged repost, but. At you slide it now. Yeah. Make exactly. the most of it now. Oh, that, yeah. That's really my mentality. It's like, let me do as much as I can with it right now because I don't know how long yeah. I'll be able to do it. But at the very least, I hope, because I'm not looking to monetize right um at least right now just just, you know, just awareness so, just right yeah. awareness so at the very least maybe they'll just say hey look we'll take your ad dollars like youtube does on some videos we copyright it you're cool you're not getting any strikes or anything like that and we're not blocking it but we're gonna run ads on this and we're gonna give yeah. money to the owner cool It'd probably be annoying for the user experience side of it but as long as i'm able to do what i'm do i'm able to do right <laughs> i'll be good yeah, exactly. But yeah, the key takeaways for this is check out Facebook's Creator Studio, definitely. And keep yes. an eye out for the other features like rolling out soon with the ads and stuff. But yeah, the Facebook Creator Studio is, is the number one thing you need to be looking at as an indie like right yeah. now. Yeah, for those who are just listening, definitely check out Facebook Creator Studio. And we'll start putting links to these things in the description as well. Another thing to quickly touch on that we just I just told you about today is this new music workflow app called Bounce, which just rolled out to everyone. And the idea of Bounce is that it streamlines file sharing to document the creation of a record. So it allows music creators and their team to organize different track stems, different recordings, the metadata, different versions, and you can securely send demos to each other within this platform. And I think the idea of having be able to document a journey from the original like voice memos to the final product is going to be really interesting as one standpoint. And on the other hand, you've also got a really secure platform to store metadata so that everyone has got the credits they, they, they deserve and they should have for their contributions to the song. Yeah. There's so many companies that have done this, uh, that have been trying to yeah. tackle this space, right? Um, Splice so even tried to do that, but they've, found that it was just bigger, much, much bigger of a market in the sound space than heavily on that collaboration side. Cause there's so much to how music musicians are already in their own, like they already have their own workflow. All right. So get, trying to get them yeah. to collaborate and do things across is, is very hard. There's been a lot of apps that have tried to get people or yeah, to try to get people to collaborate in real time. A lot of people working on that across platforms, but it just doesn't work. Um, but this focusing on just the workflow of the process, I can't remember the apps that I knew about that were doing this, but there were a few people um, a couple of years ago that were trying to do a version of this. <laughs> I think that part is really cool for those reasons that you said, because right now, yes, is really dope that like I, if I could, I could just save my voice note and share it with somebody. But now this all is being organized. It allows me to strategically consider it as a part of the campaign versus having to remember to save it and keep it somewhere and all that kind of stuff. So activating it as a part of a campaign. You, the example you used was Selena Gomez, right? If people yeah. could hear her voice note it, when she first yeah. came up with the song. That the was melody really, line, yeah. Yeah, that was a really cool example because I know fans would love that and eat that up and to see a part of that journey. And we know how much documenting is just become a serious part of marketing in itself. Exactly. So this is just another thing that allows you to utilize that will long term allow you to utilize a part of the canvas as your actual marketing um, campaign when you bring exposure to different parts of the process. So I I, lo I love this. There's so many different. Obviously, when you're recording your track, there's so many different versions it goes through. You've got the original voice memos. The original, the original lyrics, and you've got different versions of the, dem the the original demos that are just made, you know, with 
the basic instruments and you've got the actual live instruments coming in or, or professional instruments. Like the, the evolution is just all going to be in this one app. And what I like about it most is that you don't even need the app to like be part of the process. They can, you can send a song or place to anyone and they can just put your phone, your phone number. And then when you're ready, you then can go in to download the app if you want to, but you can send your files without even needing the app. And their main aims for this app are to use Bounce as a vehicle to showcase these multiple versions of a track and also even use it as a passive income for streaming. Like you could, other artists could take some of the stems from the original demos and make their own tracks. And sample cool. them. And that's, you know, that's an excellent feature. That right there is, a, because it's similar to, I don't know if you're familiar with the fact that obviously people sell loops, right? But then you also have people who sell hooks, right? Yeah. Um, and people are always trying to figure out how to do these things. These are this is samples, place um, placements, right? Sinks. All these things are already there. This is just allowing that to happen on an easier way for the indie, right? Democratizing the process a little bit, so they might end up with a database. To I don't know how they're going to really use that feature, like or allow people to access and search that feature. But th that could be a cool database to see where now I can just go through that, that platform and listen to music. And then I see, oh, I like this song. Let me go open up the stems and find a piece as a part of my production. That'll be really cool. Because they, might, they, might have, they might have used certain melodies they then scrapped and didn't make the final products you could use and do something with. Like, yeah, this whole, didn't, like, didn't Kanye like, release, for like Life of Palo, didn't he release different sections of the song and different stems? There's something he did where he documented like, about parts of the journey. This year? No, this is like a few years ago. Kanye kind of yeah. released different parts of, you know, the making, the creation of the song, like, you know, where it started to how it ended up. No, nah, I, I don't think he did. That. I, mean, I think I was, I've I've been been following Kanye on a, a lot of his stuff over the last few years. <laughs> <laughs> I, I take my doses. <laughs> yeah, I think I think he did, but I have to look into it. But main things to this app is that Bounce is available on iOS now and will be on Android early next year. Obviously, it's very early days. This is just. But the, the vision and the goals are there and they're heading in the right direction, I feel. And I think it's going to be, we've talked about the discovery side, but also the metadata side is so important because it's a bit of a mess at the moment in the industry, like keeping track of, make sure everyone gets paid what they deserve for their contributions to the song. But if you've got it all in this one app and it's like, you know, like it's there in black and white and everyone can control what they did for the song, you know, it's going to be a lot easier to get the payments right. Yeah. I hope this will last. I really like the vision and see a lot of benefits from different angles that we could touch on as it goes. But I actually yeah. hope this one lasts. This been I've just been it's been so I've, many. I, yeah, I've seen so many, and they you don't hear about them the next year. So just getting over the first year, getting to a point where you have a true position and the right customer base and all that stuff in place is hard enough. So yeah. Let's let's, they, let's, they, let's root for them. <laughs> yeah, they they seem serious. You know, they got they got the press coverage on Billboard. They've got the financial backing. It I doesn't think, matter. Yeah, it's <laughs> I'm, just I'm, it's, I'm just I'm matter. just hold, I'm just holding out hope. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. there's well, been so many. You that, can raise fifty million, have every record label behind you, and all that stuff. Yeah, because the, the barrier to consumers. That's the hardest part. That's why, like, on shows like Shark Tank, right, they'll be like, what are your actual sales? Because that's the part. Like, all the other stuff is cool until you get the actual consumer and, and they're coming back. Not just tried it out one time, but now they repeat and it's sticky. That's, that's the thing. And getting people out of their current systems, even for something better, is always difficult. At least for this one, they are trying to do lots of different things in one, whereas a lot of them were just focusing on metadata storage or just stem storage but at least with this there are multiple revenues where you can make stream you can make some money from there are like storing multiple facets like but often i'll argue against that though because normally you would but in the context of this i'm not sure right. sure because the others have failed like they have to they still have to have an entry point where at least one yeah. of those things yeah. they they focus on being really dope at so people keep coming back for that stickiness you're not going to have people be sticky for five different things immediately so yeah. I like the the roadmap I love, but where they're starting out with things, I wonder which feature they're going to be looking at for sure, for sure, as the repeat. Because what they're thinking right now, I don't know how much customer discovery and 
you know, this probably did do beta. Is it beta now or is this after beta? It's now public. It's after beta now. Okay. So I'm sure they've discovered some things and they know which part. I haven't got a chance to look into that, which part they want to be the sticky thing. But um, I do love the direction in those features that'll be added on. I think there's going to be a lot of benefit for being on that platform. But I'm just, you know, I'm just scoring because I know how hard it is to actually yeah, yeah. <laughs> achieve and make that happen. The dopest part of everything you've talked about in that platform is the fact that you don't have to be on it to get it. I would exactly. to use it, right? Because yeah. now it's once again making it just that much easier for you to become familiar with it and get you into that marketing funnel um, from awareness down to, you know, hopefully power user, I'm sure that's what they're looking for. So I, I, I like it. I, I love particularly that stems aspect. Um, the next thing will be how do we allow people to utilize that? It's a capable capability, but I want, I'm interested to get in the back end to see how you, easy it is. Are you helping me? You um, create the stems and make this process super easy. Are, are you helping me find customers? Because that from a producer yeah. side, right? And the artist side is going to be the thing that they really want right oh man you're helping me find customers it's cool that i can do this but if i already have trouble finding a fan base now you saying i have to go find customers is another headache that i'm not even good at yet there's a lot of room to grow yeah i think the main focus from initially is going to be the storage sending of demos and having more than one place because it can get very very messy with all the various like google drive folders and drop boxes and like but having them all in one place for everyone to work on at the same time that is the I'm sure that would be the initial focus, I think. Right, right. Yeah. It would be like Google Drive and Dropbox catering to artists. Yeah, that's, that's, where, that's where I see him focusing on initially, I think, from what I've read. Cool. Which I think it's, it's a good place to start, I think. Just get everyone familiar with how, how it works and operates and then expand the features from there. 100%. But, so that, that's Bounce. Um, so that's pretty much the main news topics of this month. There's been quite a lot of ha happening, as it always is. But um, I thought we'd end with a few... Social media trend predictions for 2020. So I read the Talk Walker and HubSpot report, which broke down various different, you know, marketing strategies moving forward. And I've sort of adapted it for the music industry. Some key takeaways. So number one, which you'll love, is uh, TikTok will be part of your marketing strategy next year, no matter what. <laughs> As you banged yeah. on about for, you know, everyone just get on TikTok. As Sean's been saying for you know forever now, like yeah. nearly 750 million monthly active users. 66% of the users are under 30. So, you know, you've got a, a good base to target the younger generation there. 750 just, million? Yeah, monthly I didn't even realize users. I didn't even realize that number was that big yet. So, yeah. Yeah. Bro. All so right. just, it's a wrap. Just, just get on it, yeah. Um, an interesting one. Social media wellness mm. is going to be an essential part of consumer engagement, they're predicting. Mm. Because... So apparently there's been 78,000 conversations about social media wellness in 2019 online. And there's a, there a national day of unplugging in the US, which gained quite a few thousand mentions. And there's obviously, the main thing for this is the fact that Instagram are going to be highly likes and experimenting with that right now, aren't they? And the idea that this might get away from the superficial and lead more into active engagements, because you know, if I'm going through Instagram right now, I'll just like something to say that I've seen it and interact with this person. but if that isn't, if this sorry, isn't that option, like you might be, able to, you might encourage you more to like actually comment on their posts instead. If they can't see the number of likes, like you might be, might be more active engagement. So, true. Actually, for me, honestly, they've actually started doing that over the last few days. It, it, it was weird, and I couldn't figure out. What, I was like, "What's going on? Something's missing." And I noticed I can see, you know, how someone has, let's just say, a hundred likes, and you'll see like two names. And yeah, yeah, number, yeah. I don't see the number. Yeah, I, I have no idea how many likes people have on my Instagram right now. Because I, th I think they might, yeah, they might move it to. You might, you might not even see eventually any your own personal likes. So you might encourage people to leave comments instead, just to, you know, engage with you. I think we're going to get a lot more active engagement moving forward if they do commit to this route forward. And that all links into you know the social wellness and you know like quality messaging and making sure that you know, people have a happy experience online. So they've right. said that um, you'll, have, you'll have fewer opportunities to engage with fans if they're not going to go on social media so much. So you need to really focus on your key messages. And they've also suggested things like, you know, 
rather than push the music to your fans, you know, share stories, tell jokes, ask questions, share what you believe in, you know, get involved in social causes. Like mm. it's just a new way. It's just you're really going to have to adapt your thinking of how to communicate with your fans in the future. If we are going away from this passive engagement more towards active engagement. No. More and more personal, allowing them to get closer to you. Which comes back to my dark social point from the beginning of the conversation about, you know, the, the private communities. Like that's the way, that's the direction we're heading in, I think. Yeah. And what else have we got on here? I'm working so, on a video, by the way, that that'll, that kind of touches on that. Um, okay, cool. Why there, there aren't going to be as many superstars. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. 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 Uh, Generation Z will only engage if you pivot your strategy. So the prediction is that by 2021, mobile search advertising will exceed desktop advert spend on Instagram in the US for the first time, mm. which makes sense. Um, 84% of millennials say they don't trust traditional advertising. Mm. Um, they, they talked about new methods of advertising, such as voice search and social media e-commerce and mm. smart speakers and things like new ways to advertise. Um, and the other big thing as well is that you're going to invest a lot more in user-generated content because 90% of purchasing decisions are led by user-generated content right now. And obviously the most liked image on Instagram is an egg. So that's the most liked image on Instagram is an egg, not, no, not an influencer, not a person. It's just an egg. So wow. and someone, just, someone just created that and said, let's try and get like, the most likes on the platform. And that's just user-generated content. So, Yeah, that's... <laughs> It just it's just indirect media uh, media like really controlling environment versus coming direct with messages. That's going to be interesting. I I understand that we say that and we don't trust it, but in in some ways I feel like it'll get to a point where people consume it as just another piece of content. Even if they see that as an ad, they'll actually get rid of the whole idea because right we have these platforms like instagram and facebook that are really trying to make it meaningful right when well, i Instagram, facebook right and all these other platforms that are really trying to make marketing meaningful mm -hmm. people where you're not just seeing a whole bunch of bs we're, okay if you have bs and it's not relevant to our consumers then we're going to keep that app from, that ad from showing to people so there's going to get a quality of advertising that um to a point that happens where people truly do consider the things that they see and but they don't put it above or below any other piece of content they're pursuing. Right now, there's like a negative connotation to ads, but I think it's going to get to equilibrium at some point where people are just so they are, are so um, what's the word I'm thinking? They just think so independently, and they're so based on their own opinion. They actually analyze things for for what they are versus all these other stigmas attached to it of how it came to me. You get what I mean? And this links as well to micro influencers having a lot more influence than the big superstars do as well, because you, you know you, they're more your interaction with them are a lot more like personal level. You trust them a lot more because they're not so like distant from you. They're, they're you know got a smaller following. You've you've, cut, you've grown up with them. You feel like more connected to them. So I think mm -hmm. a lot. I think you'll be utilizing a lot more micro influencers next year as opposed to trying to go for the bigger ones. If you're trying to if you if you're going down that route, I think it's just a lot more impactful. They have a lot of higher engagement rates as well. And they're like You can tell the numbers are there and they're cheaper. And also they get a lot more engagement in terms of percentage. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. They'll probably be the anti-wave. I mean, we, we talk about it from a marketing standpoint, but the marketing is only really following the consumer engagement perspective anyway. So if the marketing dollars are showing that it's better to go micro influencers, it's probably a symptom of people truly trying to detach away from these general level superstars, right? Like, okay, I'm looking for the anti-star, which is something so many yeah. people do when they're teenagers anyway. But now even doing that from an influencer standpoint, right? That that's not just music. I'm going to look at these people are the big corporations. That's almost what the influencers represent at, at some point. Yeah. Right. It's like, these are the big general companies, but that doesn't speak to my personality. That's just another voice in my life versus where I where, something I feel closely attached to, so that'll be that'll be interesting to see. Uh, yeah. and, that, and that all links to your your, your point about there's gonna be less superstars because if everyone's moving towards the dark social, 
less people are going to get seen on the bigger platforms. If they're high in likes, they're going to get less engagement anyway. It's just, it's all sort of feeding into less of like the absolute mega stars now. And it'll be a lot less important to represent the community and more important to control the community. Yeah. That's what it's going to lend to. And the people who are smart, they'll do that. Like, I'm not the superstar. It's, it's not so ego based. Right. Like yeah, you got, everybody yeah. has to love me. Yeah. No, I run this community and I get the indirect, you know, uh, social positioning because I run this community. But other than that, like it just self feeds and maybe I find profit models off of just running the community itself. Yeah, so I, I would say for you, for you artists out there now, I'd really focus on trying to build your own community. Obviously, you grow your brand at the same time and, you know, try and get the engagement, but you really just focus on, you know, your core fans because they're the ones that are going to fund your career moving forward anyway. And especially if we're moving towards this really sort of like, uh, what's the one I'm looking for? Like, you know, small community-based things rather than like the big wide web. So, yeah, just focus on building your community, definitely. Yep. I've been huge on that, by the way. If you have an adjacent yeah. interest, even if it doesn't have to be around you, right? It doesn't have to be weird. You like reading books? And there's some artists I'm thinking that might be Ari Lennox or somebody. I think she has a book club now. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like um, Tom the Mailman, you don't know him, but he's a local artist in Atlanta. He has like a, a Discord group, right? That And and people who are interested in, and they're just chatting about those things, right? There, there's so many different things that your fans anything, are in, yeah. yeah, that they're interested if, in. If you like. You like it too? Yeah, if, if you like anime, make an anime community around your music. Like, if, if you or if you if you like if you like a particular sport, like just you know, just, just find something that you know means a lot to you outside your music, and just try and bring it in and see which ones you know share the same opinion as you, and just really build out from there. That's it. That's it. I think that's the perfect place to end the conversation. I think that's that. They're the key messages. Yeah. Oh, cool. Well, look, lot, lots to unpack here. Yeah. A, a lot of things to unpack. Again, the first episode of Music News That Matters. Give us any kind of feedback that you guys have. Uh, we're definitely going to keep evolving how we present this. But this is the beginning of, again, a goal and vision of making really relevant news to artists far more digestible and maybe even a little entertaining. So, as always, if you like this video, go ahead and hit the like button. If you like it, you might as well share it. And if you are not subscribed, you know what to do hit that subscribe button. It's the network. Ow.